and John, for many years you were a guy in a book or a voice in a CD or a good reference in an MBSR class, but now you're real <laughs> in many ways. Thank you for seating us in your lap and thank you for all the giants where are sitting on the shoulders, like you said in your book. Uh, my thank question, you. I had to write it down many times. Where are you calling from? <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm calling from call San Diego. San Diego. Uh, originally from- Chile. Chile, Sorry? Santiago, Chile. San Diego, California. Oh, San Diego, San Diego. okay. But uh, yes, you're right, my accent is Latino and I am from Colombia, South okay. America. Okay. So uh, in, in my question has a few doors, but in the spirit of your question of who's breathing, the, the drop of water in the ocean and the ocean in the drop of water and that recognition underneath the idea of like and dislike. And from many of us coming to the land of freedom, which is the United States, I'm for sure we, or at least I feel safer here, coming from a country that we encourage and we have to deal with the war on drugs yeah. and the guerrilla and the corruption and the violence and many, many things that are really sad and in res uh, respecting all the suffering and recognizing all the suffering in me. I would like uh, to ask you um, about liberation, liberation talking perhaps from the ego perspective, from that idea of me, my suffering, my background, my country, my parents, my pain, yeah. uh, that I identification with all of that, that is not allowing um, us, I spoke uh, for myself to be free, uh, to not attain a state of moksha or liberation or satori, but to, to, to liberate ourselves from that ego, is that liberation? Would you explain that, please, if you can? <laughs> it's hard to explain it to your head <laughs> because your head will do what you just did, which is uh, use all these words that you know are thoughts. And what, what is really being pointed to is something that's beyond thinking. Hmm. Okay, so in the Heart Sutra, for instance, it says form is emptiness and emptiness is form. That which is form is emptiness, that which is emptiness form. And the same is true for feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness, okay? And then it goes into this whole litany of no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue. Right? It is pointing to some other element of being that's intrinsic to us, a form of intelligence that's already here. It's not something that you attain. And it's not a special state. It's more like a hidden dimension. Yeah. Okay. The, you know, I, I have some a vague idea of what life might be like in Colombia. And I have a lot of friends who are from Colombia who are doing great work there with mindfulness in Colombia. Um, but whether it's Colombia, whether it's the United States, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, you know, there's the kind of the, the actuality of the culture and all of the belief systems that people need to co-create, that are needed to co-create the belief in Russia or the United States or Colombia or anything like that. It's actually a fiction. Hmm. As I said, from space, you don't see a line between Russia and China or between Canada and the United States. Okay, so we've created this elaborate structure of meaning about who you are and who, who you belong to and what your past was and what your future is. And all of it, when you boil it right down, is thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're not going to liberate yourself by more thinking. <laughs> We're getting some answer from some very clever person that's going to give you the answer. And then all of a sudden, 
you're going to get it. You're going to really get it. That you can't get it. There's nothing to get. So um, in uh, the the diamonds, let's see how does, how does this go? Hui Neng, the sixth uh, Zen patriarch in the Chan Chinese Chan tradition. Uh, it is said when he was a young boy, he was a rice pounder in the kitchen of a monastery in China in the sixth century, you know, uh, AD in China. And it's said that he, his love for wisdom and for understanding was profound, for liberation was profound, even though he'd never been to school, he was completely, you know, unschooled, uneducated. He's walking by a window one day and he hears a monk chanting from the Diamond Sutra and only one line he hears. He hears one line, develop a mind that clings to nothing. And it's said, of course, I wasn't there and it's a big story and maybe he never even existed, but to develop, what does it mean to develop a mind that clings to nothing? That doesn't mean get as stupid as you can by not thinking. But the operative verb is to cling, to self-identify. And the Buddha also said that all of his 45 years of teaching could be encapsulated in one sentence. And I've said this before, but it's worth repeating that maybe we should keep that sentence in mind, even if we don't understand it with our conceptual mind. And that sentence is nothing is to be clung to. Again, the verb to cling, develop a mind that clings to nothing. So nothing is to be clung to as I, me, or mine. Yes. So what, what is being pointed to here is that awareness is a hidden dimension. You already have it. So there's no place to go, nothing to do, and no special something to attain because the you that's longing for you is already you. So that's why the meditation practice, when you cultivate it in a formal way on a regular basis, and then let it become your default mode in everyday life so that life itself becomes the meditation practice, you don't even need to be concerned about liberation. Liberation may be moment by moment by moment. You know, the less you contract around clinging to, I like this, I don't like that. In the moment that you don't do it, that's a moment of liberation. You don't need to make a big thing about it or, you know, sort of post it on Twitter. <laughs> it's just a moment of liberation. And then, of course, the next moment you could be back in the prison of your own self-creation. The full catastrophe of what's going on now and the human condition in general is kind of conspiring to make us contract in fear, okay, uh, uncertainty, not mm. just for ourselves, but for our loved ones, for everything that we value. And, and so to a first approximation, if you are in some sense already uh, awake and already your true nature is wholeness, then what if you actually turn the tables on it, did a little mental Aikido, and just as a first approximation, assume that maybe you're already awake. Mm. And the reason you don't recognize it, or we don't recognize it, is because we're getting in our own way mm -hmm. with thinking. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you see the, that the thinking is getting in your own way, you don't have to be caught up in the thought stream. You can let the thought stream just do itself, and you're the knower. Mm -hmm. So that's why I sometimes emphasize, be the knowing that awareness already is. But also that's not complete because you also have to be the not knowing and the knowing that you don't know. And I know that sounds a little too crazy or Zen or whatever, but this is, that's the finger pointing towards an experience where if you want liberation, the you that's wanting the liberation is not recognizing the you that's already liberated in this timeless moment. So that's a kind of yoga of recognition, a yoga of... And, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, they talk about uh, undistracted, unfabricated non-meditation. 
non-meditation. That's in some sense why I've been saying, if you think you're meditating and that's kind of forcing you to fabricate some kind of experience, yeah. some kind of good meditative experience, then you're creating problems for yourself. So whatever works for you in terms of reminding yourself that you're already whole and your eyes, even the Buddha, if he were here right now, could not improve on what your eyes are doing in this moment, what your nose is doing, what your tongue is doing, what your fingers and hands are doing, what your heart is doing. You're pretty good <laughs> in this moment. Nice. 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 Maybe there's nothing missing, including mm. wakefulness, mm. except that it's obscured by the clouds of your own tumultuous mind. Welcome to the club. We're all wired up that way. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we can't experience the spaciousness of awareness even when it's cloudy. Okay. It's a different way of knowing. I hope that answers your question at least enough to keep you practicing for the next 30 or 40 years. Thank you, John, very, very much. And God bless you. I want to add to my question a little note. Um, uh, some of us, we have lost our jobs and or, I will say our jobs are waiting for us. <laughs> uh, some of us are doing... Uh, a lot of karma yoga from home, offering classes, meditation, and so on. And I, I would like to um, ask you, and Soren, if, if we could uh, at least contribute with one dollar or 50 cents or something for the, for the time and energy and beautiful sangha that you guys are putting together. That's very world. beautiful. But... Uh, it's not at all necessary. We are doing this out of love. And the only way you can, in some sense, I'll use the word repay. <laughs> I don't like to even use that terminology, but I'm using it. You'll see why in a minute is to pay it forward. Yeah. In other words, give money to people who have food insecurity, who are waiting on those long lines to get food for their family because they 30 million people lost their job in four weeks. Okay, uh, a lot of people on, on this call have money. We are need to be, to whatever degree your heart is moved to do it, pay it forward. And we don't pay it forward by taking people who are out of, you know, who don't have a home or out of work and telling them they should be mindful. Yeah. They should be meditating, then everything would be okay. That's insane. Yeah. No, well, what they need at the moment is food security, they need housing security, they need justice, they need to be recognized as humans. And believe me, the bureaucracy often doesn't, especially when it's not, you know, constructed to be able to hand out trillions of dollars in a matter of weeks. Yes. So, uh, you know, we, that's the only way to, to, that's the love affair. It's like, it's love in all different forms, including financial support where it's really needed. And I thank you for the offer. But uh, uh, I think I speak for Soren and myself that we're, we're good at the moment and, uh, you know, much appreciated. On the other hand, meditation centers also mm. are really hemorrhaging because nobody can go there. So even in spite of uh, being online, they're losing, you know, huge amounts of revenue and, and, you know, no business can survive forever in that kind of circumstance. So um, it's hard to know exactly how to let our generosity move in the world that will help us over this, this hump, especially since we don't know how long the hump will last. But uh, I, I really trust that we're doing everything we can to make that happen. And I'll just mention once again, my friend Shelley uh, Tagilski, who has been on uh, a number of times here, <clears throat> who developed this thing called the uh, pandemic of love. So you can check that out. And it's a way that if you do have resources, anybody who has resources can connect up with someone who doesn't directly and help them out over this terrible period of time where families like all of a sudden are like out of livelihood. Yeah. 
and then meditation is not what they need. What they need is money and they need not empathy or pity, but they need compassion in action. And sometimes that looks like money with no strings attached. Thank you, John, very much. And God bless you and all, all, the, all your family and including this family that you have helped to create to your Thank wisdom. You. And yes, I'll second that emotion. <laughs> Thank you. All right.